Are we live? Yes, it seems so. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the Kipu 2021 event series in AI today. Uh, my name is Mary Fortunato, and I'm part of the Kipu team. And I'm also a research scientist at DeepMind. I'll be very briefly telling you what we have prepared for today. For those of you who are joining for the first time, welcome. Kipu 2020-21 event series in AI is a series of monthly online meetings geared towards supporting the advancement of AI talent in Latin America. In general, each session will consist of two sessions. The first part, conversations on AI, which are fireside chats with AI researchers exploring the most critical topics and unsolved problems in AI today. In the second part, usually, we have an applications of AI session where we cover in detail examples of AI applications in the real world, its challenges and opportunities, focusing on a Latin American perspective. But today, instead of the applications in AI session, we'll host our first Kipu 2021 social, and I'll share more details about that because I'm very excited about the social. So please don't leave the event after the fire set is over. So in the past months, we had many amazing events with the speakers you see on these slides. Uh, on the topics of reinforcement learning, self-supervised learning, and fairness and biases in AI. If you miss any of this meeting, or you would enjoy a recap, you can watch the recordings in our Kipu Crowdcast profile. The link is on the chat as well. I take, I take this opportunity to thank our sponsors for supporting Kipu 2021, allowing us to host these events free of charge for everyone. So today we'll start our fireside chat with Jeff Hinton and Norio Vinyas, no less. So please use the ask a question feature to ask live questions so others will have a chance to upvote the questions as well. But let's also use the chat as you already are to express emotions, leave live comments, basically to bring some warmth to these online events. Thank you for the class. <laughs> After the fire chat, we'll head, to, we'll head to Gather Town for our social event. The link will be shared after the conversation session is over. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Gather Town is basically this 2D grid world where you get assigned an avatar and you can walk around and have video calls with the avatars that are close to you. So it's way more interactive. So you'll be able to be on camera, chat with people from the Kipo community. There is no pre-established format. We invite you to join, to, to introduce yourself, talk about AI, or visit our sponsor booths to learn about career opportunities. We also have pre-assigned spaces that you see on the top, where you can speak Portuguese, Spanish, and there are some topics that we thought it would be interesting, such as NLP, computer vision, random, PhD chat, but really, feel free to chat about anything as you would in a coffee break in a conference. So without further ado, let me introduce our host and our guest for today's event. If we can have them on camera. Yes, there they are. Let's start with Oreo. So Oreo Vinyas is a principal scientist at DeepMind and a team lead of the Deep Learning Group. Prior to joining DeepMind, Oreo was part of the Google Brain team. Oreo is an active member and great supporter of our Kipu community. He was one of our speakers in 2019 in our event in Montevideo. And he's also a member of our Slack channel that I invite you to join. So feel free to ping him over there. So Oreo is an early adopter of deep learning. Some of his contributions, such as sequence to sequence, knowledge distillation, which was in collaboration with Jeffrey, or TensorFlow, are used in Google Translate, text to speech, and speech recognition, serving billions of queries every day. Oreo was the lead researcher of the AlphaStar project, 
creating a Grandmaster AI agent in the game of StarCraft. And the paper for this work was featured as the cover of the Nature Journal. He was also involved in other well-known projects such as WaveNet and AlphaFold. Oreo is also the recipient of the 2016 MIT Tech Review Innovator Under 35 Award, and his articles have been cited over 100,000 times. <laughs> That's so impressive. I cannot read the, the number. Uh, but as a personal disclaimer, Oreo is also my husband, so these achievements, they look all particularly shiny through my eyes. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to, to introduce Jeff, Jeff Hinton, which I'm sure most, if not all of us, are familiar with. But nonetheless, it's my honor, real honor, to refresh a bit of his backgrounds and some of his achievements. So Jeff Hinton is a fellow of CIFAR, the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research, an emeritus professor at the University of Toronto, a VP Engineering Fellow at Google and Chief Scientific Advisor at the Vector Institute. Jeff is one of the pioneers of the deep learning and shared the 2018 Turing Award with colleagues Yosha Benjo and Ian Lecun for their breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. He was one of the researchers who introduced the backpropagation algorithm and the first to use backpropagation for learning word embeddings. His research group in Toronto made major breakthroughs in deep learning that revolutionized speech recognition and object classification. His research has been cited almost half a million times. And as a matter of fact, he is the ninth most cited person in Google Scholar in the world. So Jeff has been an inspiration and in reference for, for many AI researchers, myself included, but on a personal note, I would like to add how I met Jeff because it was a rather unusual way and maybe he himself doesn't remember. So in 2014, I was a math graduate student at UC Berkeley and I was starting to grow interest in AI. I went to the Bay Learn event, which was free and also had free food. <laughs> I stopped talking to this nice gentleman who explained a lot of basic concepts and discussed object representation in the brain, how he thought it worked, how we had to represent that using AI system. And only much later, I got to know that he was Jeff Hinton, basically a legend in AI and for, for deep learning. But nonetheless, he took the time to chat with a clueless but curious graduate student. And I'm so glad we got to know each other through that event and that he agreed to speak today with us in Kipu in basically very, like in a few minutes, he replied saying yes. And I was so glad because I thought who would be our star guest to have here and it would be Jeff. So thank you so much, Jeff and Oreo for joining here today. And I ask everyone to make some noise on the chat and welcome our guests so we can start this conversation. Uh, and please use the ask a question button for questions. You can post it also in Spanish or Portuguese. Uh, Oreo is also from Spain. Entonces, um, hablas español de portuñol muy bien. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. Now I'll pass it to Oreo. Yeah, thank you so much for, for the introduction. I guess um this is very exciting for me i i i don't get to to chat to to jeff so much since uh, we used to share actually an office back in brain but but may, maybe let me also tell you how i really met jeff uh, because it's it's going to be relevant for some of the conversations and and the discussions so it will tell you a little bit who jeff really is and i i think that's to me the most amazing bit that maybe not many people know so how I really met Jeff is I was in, I just joined Google Brain and I just was trying to figure out things out. And all of a sudden, Jeff comes to, to me, to, to my desk and says, oh, you should come see something that I have on my screen. So I go, I go to where he sits or, or doesn't sit, rather he stands. And he shows me on the screen some 
filters of a neural network, right? So like the weights of the neural network that he had just trained um, and, and showed me a bit the shape of the filters, that's something that hopefully many of you practitioners take a look sometimes, but um, he just was super excited about um, what he had just learned or what the model has, has had just learned. And I think this is really the most amazing part about Jeff, that he still um, codes, uh, implements uh, experiments, uh, computes gradients, hopefully with aid of uh, auto differentiation and brainstorms a lot about ideas. Uh, no, that's manually computes gradients is quite amazing. Uh, you should look at the MATLAB code he posted, for instance, on his website. So I think I think this is really quite unique, very aspirational to at this stage of, of, of your career still be so much hands on. Um, so welcome, Jeff. And maybe to kick off uh, after like saying hi to our audience, I'll ask you, what's the last experiment you've run? What was it on? What was it trying to do? Well, I'm currently running an experiment downstairs <laughs> that's training a big Boltzmann machine. Um, not one of these restricted Boltzmann machines that makes the training algorithm easy, but I think I figured out how to train a big one and I'm training it to see if it works. Great. So, so actually, maybe many of our audience might not even know what a Boltzmann machine is. So can you tell us a bit more intuitively what, what are you trying to do with a not restricted but Boltzmann machine? OK. Long, long ago, in a galaxy far away, um, there were two learning algorithms. So this was 1984, about then. There was Backprop, which we all know about. And there was a different learning algorithm called Boltzmann machines. And they were the two learning algorithms that could learn hidden representations. That is, they could take neurons that weren't part of the input or output, and they could learn what to do with them. And they would learn to use them for representing interesting things that were going to be useful. Um, the backpropagation was a boring, straightforward algorithm that worked rather well. And Boltzmann machines was a much better algorithm. It was much more interesting intellectually, much more likely to be what the brain's doing. And it never worked very well. Um, so in, you all know how backpropagation works. So I'll tell you how Boltzmann machines work. Um, it was inspired by work by Hopfield and Francis Crick, in particular, Francis Crick. Um, so the idea is, you OK, let's take a neural net. It's got some um, units where you represent data, and it's got some hidden units. And it doesn't have any other units. There's no output units. So this is designed for unsupervised learning. And the aim is that you show it lots of data. And after a while, if you look at the units inside the network, they're representing all sorts of interesting things about the data. Like maybe whenever you show it a cat, one of the units goes ping. Um, that's what you'd like. And we want a really simple way of learning that that biology could do. And here's a really simple way of learning it. You have two phases of learning. There's called the positive phase and the negative phase. In the positive phase, you show it data, and you let the neurons settle down to what's called thermal equilibrium, or a statistician will call it the stationary distribution. And what's happening is you fix the states of the units where you represent data. Those would be pixel intensities, for example. And the other units keep updating their states based on the input they're getting from the data and from the other hidden units. Um, it doesn't have to be layered. And the connections in this network are all symmetrical. That is, if there's two units A and B, the connection from A to B has the same weight as the connection from B to A. And because the connections are symmetrical, there's an energy function. That's what Hopfield realized. So Newton's third law is that action and reaction are equal and opposite. And if you implement that for neurons, if you say the amount by, neuro, by which neuron A, when it goes ping, affects neuron B, is the same as the amount by which neuron B affects neuron A, then there'll be an energy function. And when the network settles down, if you run it non-stochastically, it just settles to the minimum of that energy function. That's what Hopfield realized. Terry Sanofsky and I realized that if you actually add noise, so make it make a stochastic decision, then it will reach an equilibrium distribution of an energy function called the Boltzmann distribution. And we initially use that for doing searches. But then 
later on, we realized there's a simple learning algorithm. And the learning algorithm is really neat. You put data on the data units. And then you let all the other units rattle around, um, influencing each other for long enough to reach thermal equilibrium. And there's a big question about how long that is. But with data there, that might be fine. So if it's a neural net that when you give it data can only see one thing, or typically only sees one thing, it'll reach thermal equilibrium quite fast because it's got a basically a unimodal distribution. And once it's reached thermal equilibrium, you measure how often two units are on together. They might be two hidden units. There might be a data unit and a hidden unit. And you only bother to do that for units that have a connection between them. So it can be sparsely connected, if you like. So that's called the positive phase. And you're just measuring this correlation. And then in the negative phase, you don't show it any data. So it's free to do whatever it likes. And the units all rattle around and go ping and make other units go ping. And you wait for a while, which might be about the age of the universe, um, but hopefully shorter. And then you measure the correlations. And that's called the negative phase. And now the correct maximum likelihood learning rule, this is what's amazing, is that you should change your weight in proportion to the difference between the correlation of the two units in the positive phase and the correlation of the two units in the negative phase. That's really neat. It's not like backprop, where you have activities that are propagated in one phase and derivatives that are propagated in another phase, which is very unneuron-like. It's just neurons going ping, um, sometimes with the data clamped and sometimes without the data clamped. And Crick's idea was that Crick didn't have any math for it, but he had the idea with Graham Mitchison that if you um, didn't clamp the data and did unlearning, that would somehow make it work better. And what Terry Sanofsky and I established is that if you use the right kind of neurons, which are logistic neurons, stochastic logistic neurons, which have binary states, but turn on with a probability of one over one plus e to the minus their total input, um, then the learning rule that just takes the difference of the correlations when the data is clamped or when it's not clamped, that is the maximum likelihood learning rule. And it's ridiculously easy to implement in a neural net. And there's only one thing wrong with it, which is it takes the age of the universe for the neural net to settle down when you're not showing it data. Right. So there you go. I mean, Boltzmann machines explained by Jeff Hinton. So, so I, I will. I guess there's a few a few thoughts that come to mind as you were explaining these. Um, may, maybe let's start with the kind of does it bother you? Like one of obviously one of the most important papers and works was indeed the backpropagation paper. Um, so I, I'd like to know whether it bothers you to not see the connection with how the brain might work versus how in practice we're training all these models that do all these amazing things that Mary was saying. Um, and it looks like it still bothers you because you're running an experiment downstairs, but uh, can you, yeah, like, so to I which said, extent should we be worried as a community, right, about this? Okay, so the real question is, does the brain do backpropagation? And I worked with Tim Lillicrap for a long, for several years. We used to meet every few months and have long arguments. And uh, he had people at DeepMind doing simulations. And we, in the end, we produced a big nature reviews, nature reviews in Neuroscience paper about the relationship between the brain and, brain and back propagation. And we did our very best to make a plausible case for how the brain might do back propagation. And I don't believe a word of it. If you read that paper, it's just, it's these smart people trying really hard to see how this thing that's clearly not doing back propagation could be doing back propagation. Um, and it's a very convincing case, I think, we make that it doesn't. Because um, we're smart and we tried very hard. Um, I think the brain's a Boltzmann machine. And the only issue is how you get over this problem that it takes the age of the universe to get the, in the negative phase, to get the negative data. One thing to notice about Boltzmann machines is nowadays for unsupervised learning, it's very fashionable to use contrastive methods. Um, Oriel was involved in introducing a contrastive method um, that was actually a better version of something we introduced many years earlier, but we never convinced anybody of that thing because we didn't make it work very well. Um, the best kind of contrastive method is one that has the hardest negative examples. And the way to get hard negative examples is to use the model itself. Um, and that's what Boltzmann machines are doing. Their negative examples 
Now, what they're not trying to get the same representation with positive and negative examples like you are with current contrastive learning. They're trying to get the same statistics of the correlations of neural activities with positive and negative examples. Um, but they get very good negative examples. And if you could only overcome this problem that it takes forever for them to settle down, you'd really be in business. I think backpropagation is probably more efficient than what the brain uses. And it's much better at squeezing a lot of information into not many synapses. So you can squeeze a huge amount of knowledge into only a trillion synapses. Whereas the brain has a hundred trillion, it doesn't need to squeeze knowledge into, into them. So I think the brain is very good at dealing with not much data with a huge number of connections, which it doesn't use very economically in the sense, in the um, sense of saving storage on how many connections you have. What is economical about is how much data you need. Um, and it's profligate with connections and profligate right. with the amount of computation too. Yeah. So, okay. Let, we'll get back to these, I'm sure, because I know how you, how much you like this topic, Jeff, but, um, you mentioned that you're currently running an experiment downstairs. So I'm sure many people might be asking themselves on what data, uh, is it still a mist or have we, have we switched data sets and also maybe just out of curiosity, on what platform, what what software are you using to run that experiment? I'm quite curious to know. Okay, so you've heard about Moore's law, right? And Moore's law says that computers get a lot faster with time. But I managed to make my algorithms get slower with time, even faster than Moore's law. I have a bigger experiment than Moore's law. So I'm testing this new idea, not on the whole of MNIST, but on a fraction of MNIST. Because if I take the whole of MNIST, it runs too slowly. Okay, I see. Um, and I'm doing, and it runs too slowly because I'm doing it on my Mac downstairs. Oh, it's so you're running Mac, these locally. I'm doing it in MATLAB on a Mac PowerBook. Okay, and great. I, I have this belief, which isn't widely shared, which is that if you look at where the really original ideas come from, they don't come from using huge data sets. Huge data sets has very interesting properties and it's very worth exploring. I'm not against exploring huge data sets. GPT-3 tells you a lot and Google's big MENA and things tell you a lot. Um, but in terms of understanding new learning algorithms, if you remember distillation, I did the first examples in MNIST on my laptop in MATLAB and um, Boltzmann machines, well, they were developed on a LISP machine and the LISP machine took 12.5 microseconds to do a floating point multiplier. So that's, you know, a tenth of a megaflop. And machines nowadays go faster than that. Um, so I think to get radically new learning algorithms and to understand properties of learning algorithms, there's some things you'll only understand with big data sets, like what's the true nature of language. But algorithms, you can understand them with small data sets running on weak machines. And the crucial thing is, is it quick to do experiments? Can you take an idea and prove that it's wrong in half an hour? Yeah, that's that's very interesting because I think accessibility to learning methods through open source and and just making it easy and more available. Oh, we lost Jeff, I think. Oh, oh there you go. I'm back. You're back. You're back. Yeah, I was I was just saying that given the accessibility to software has improved so much, maybe we will miss out on some of these fundamentals because people might not know how to compute a gradient. And I remember very well the code that initially took me ages to understand. Um, I'm sure you use the same variable names even. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think maybe for those who are starting and especially those which maybe have more research-minded um, minds they might they might actually benefit from this right that you might want to start very small and gain a lot of intuition i mean that's that's really how you operate i mean i've seen this so many times and indeed the distillation paper people might assume oh like look the maybe oriel ran all the experiments and so on and i i i think maybe you even ran more experiments than i did even though i was starting and obviously as an individual contributor um i had a lot of time right to run experiments and to investigate that particular idea that we were developing so yeah that's a very good i think that's a very good tip maybe for 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 new starters um I, perhaps, let me tell you let me tell yeah. you one story about alan turing 
um, which I've just realized might be relevant. So he would program the early computers by flipping switches to put binary numbers in. And when they first came along with kind of programs and you know computer languages and stuff, he wouldn't have anything to do with it. He just kept flipping switches because that's what he knew how to do. And I think maybe I'm a bit like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool. So I, I, I guess it's also good to interleave a few questions from the audience. Um, I like the first question because I think you've already answered, which is what advice would you give um, to an ML enthusiast that that's just been beginning to accelerate, uh, maybe not only their experimentation, which maybe is what you were talking about, experiment fast and quick, but maybe the learning. So from a learning perspective, if you have to learn um, and you're starting today, what do you think are good resources that you might advise many people about? So I think you have to decide whether what you're trying to explore is what happens when you do gradient descent learning on big data sets, or what you're trying to explore is how to make the learning algorithms better. Okay, and so the first, so loss, like loss versus model and, and application well, versus, yeah. Um, it's to do with the properties of a lot of data, because a lot of data we've discovered Big data sets have very special properties, and you can't really study those on small data sets. Um, you couldn't do GPT-3 on sort of one book's worth of language. It just wouldn't work. Um, you, need, you need a lot. And similarly for machine translation, you wouldn't know whether it worked or not if you did it on a small data set. And so there's kind of the applications of the technology, which typically work best when you have a lot of data, and then there's the basic technology itself. And if you want to explore the basic technology itself, you want to do it on small things that you really understand and you can look at everything that's going on. You can have lots of displays up on the screen. Whenever you put a new display of something up, you discover it wasn't working the way you thought. Um, so you want to display everything in sight, like what the activities are, how the weights are evolving, what the histogram of weights is, um, what the ratio of the gradients to the values of the weights is, all those sorts of things. Um, and you get insight into what's going on. As opposed to, you take some high level language, you start with somebody else's code that's already implemented a ResNet, and then you fiddle with a few things. And I don't think you'll make new discoveries like that, radically new discoveries. But I'm just an old fashioned guy. I also believe that automatic differentiation is bad for your moral fiber. Um, the best regularizer we have for forcing other people's models to be easy for me to understand is that they had to compute the gradients. And if you look at a lot of models we have now, you'd never have these models if those people had to compute the gradients. That's true. Yeah, gradients for free. That's that's definitely the new like the new movement. I, I, I've enjoyed both sides of, of it, but I must say I will not compute gradients anytime soon, I, I suspect. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think I like the, maybe let's let's go through actually another question that goes a, a little bit more to actually Bosman machines, just so that we, we connect and maybe wrap up with how the brain works and we finally discover how it does work. So, so Fabricio is asking, um, maybe something you like, like how to reconcile the idea that the brain is a Boltzmann machine on the one hand with the notion that the connections in the brain are reinforced or dimmed over time? In other words, the connections, I guess, change over time? So the Boltzmann machine learning algorithm is the way of changing the connection strengths. You change them based on the difference of the correlations when you're clamping data and when you're letting it run free, which we thought of as sleep. Right. Um, so the 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 act of learning from a Boltzmann machine is precisely something that happens all the time in your brain. Yeah, it's it's happening all the time. Yeah, that, and that's when, to, yeah, when not much is happening, it's because the learning is equilibrated, not because it's been turned off. So if you take your low-level perceptual system, your low-level perceptual system really isn't changing much anymore because you've been saying seeing data with the same statistics for a long, long time. In your case, video games, um, <laughs> and as soon as you show it radically different data, you show it that for a day or two and your low level perceptual system will change. But the reason it was sort of static 
is just because the data was sort of static. It's learning all the time. So I have a question about another scale of learning, which I, I it bothers me because at the scale that we had, so, so it, basically evolution, right? So there is the scale at which we have brains that happen to, to be the way they are. And how do you see learning at that scale? I mean, it, are, do we need to replicate evolution or maybe that's there's a way to do gradient descent to actually accelerate that process um, how do you see the learning outside of the human brain, basically? Okay, I guess I got a lot to say about that. Um, <laughs> so, one thing we, if if you look at reinforcement learning papers, now it may change with model-based reinforcement learning. But if you look at ones that aren't using model-based reinforcement learning, um, what if you look at the horizontal axis very carefully, you'll see it says kind of one, ten, a hundred, a thousand. And you think, okay, that's how many sweeps through the training set or updates or something. And then if you look very carefully in rather small print on the right-hand side, you'll see times 10 to the 7. Just occasionally it's times 10 to the 6, but it's usually times 10 to the 7. And that's because with reinforcement learning, if you ask how much information you're getting to set the weights, the reinforcing signal, suppose it's a binary reinforcing signal and you get it after every trial, that's one bit is really not very much information. And evolution's like that. Hmm. Um, also, evolution has a big problem, which is you can't back propagate through it because, sorry, development has a big problem, not evolution, development. When an organism develops from the embryo into an adult, um, it's interacting with an environment that isn't, can't, isn't internal to the organism. Whereas if you take put an input into a neural net and turn that into an output. Everything that happens to that input is happening inside the neural net so you can get derivatives of everything. Mm. So evolution couldn't use backprop because there's all these extraneous inputs coming in. Um, so what evolution did, being a very slow, clumsy algorithm, is it evolved a brain. And it evolved a brain because a brain can do backprop. A brain can get real gradients. And whether it does it by Boltzmann machine methods, differences of correlations, or by backprop doesn't matter for this argument. It can get gradients. And in a high dimensional space, if you take like a million dimensional space and you can get a gradient, you can learn a million times faster than a method that doesn't get a gradient. And so it's completely insane to think we learned anything complicated by evolution. The role of evolution is to create a brain and create a rough architecture for the brain. And the brain is then going to do the learning. Now, it's even more complicated than that because if you're a Darwinian, you think that properties of the brain that are encoded in your DNA couldn't have been the result of learning. But actually, that's completely wrong. There's something called the Darwin effect, so the, sorry, the Baldwin effect, that's completely Darwinian. It doesn't violate any of Darwin's assumptions that acquired characteristics can't be inherited. But nevertheless, it shows that learning organisms can evolve much faster than organisms that don't learn, and they can get what's learned into their DNA mm -hmm. without being Lamarckian. Um, I could go on in about 10 minutes explain that, but I suggest you just read the article about the Baldwin effect by Steve Nyland and me. Um, Great, yeah, I, I, I've seen that, um, but yeah, maybe people like that um, you're using the one bit analogy that maybe it's been popularized by a cherry on top of a cake. So I guess you 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 believe in a way that reinforcement learning in a way is like the cherry on the cake and perhaps Boltzmann machines, if you make them work, uh, let's see how the experiment runs, might be a way to get the cake and the icing and, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Great, okay. I see great, great minds think alike. So yeah, it's good to know. Um, so, Although so there's, there, there is a Boltzmann version of reinforcement learning. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll get to that, but maybe let's let's um, let's leave Boltzmann um, alone for a little bit, because one of the the papers um, many people uh, in the audience might have read, because we mentioned in the Slack chat that this is one of the ones that you you would would like to talk about is the the Glom paper. So, 
Um, this is an interesting paper. It's a single author paper from, from Jeffrey. And I'll just read the first kind of sentence of the introduction um, because it's it's a very interesting way to maybe uh, write a paper that maybe only Jeff uh, can, can do. But um, so, so it starts like it says, this paper does not describe a working system. Instead, it presents a single idea about representation, which allows advances made by several different groups to be combined into an imaginary system called GLOM. So I have many questions, but maybe let me ask the one that um, Leo is asking from the audience. Uh, and it's very re relevant to this sentence of, of the abstract, actually, which is, um, have you made progress on the GLOM model implementation? Maybe that's what you're doing downstairs uh, since you published the GLOM paper. Yes, some. So some. I've been working with um, Sarah Sabor and a software engineer called Laura Culp. And Laura has implemented um, a very toy version to test out one particular idea in GLOM, which is one of the central ideas. And the idea is that suppose I have two, um, I suppose I've recognized two parts of an object. Let's suppose there are a nose and a mouth. But I'm not quite sure there are nose and a mouth because it's low resolution data or there's noise or whatever. So I have their possi a possible nose and a possible mouth. What I would like is to get them to disambiguate each other. I'd like the possible nose to provide information that says that the to the possible mouth, hey, that's a quite a good bet that you're a mouth. Now, if you think about doing that with transformers, it's quite tricky. So suppose that you have layers of representation and think of the nose and the mouth as like word fragments. They're gonna get revised embeddings at each layer. And the initial embeddings will be rather ambiguous like they would be for the word may. But as you go through the layers, the context will disambiguate them. That's fine for language. Um, but now try the transformer approach on um, parts of objects. And you have to deal with coordinate transforms. So if I've got a possible mouth, it really needs to send out a message that looks like this, a query in transformer talk. It needs to take the pose of the mouth in the image, that is the coordinate transform between the intrinsic frame of reference of the mouth and the image frame, so that's what I'll call the pose of the mouth. And it needs to multiply that by the relationship between a mouth and a nose. That is the coordinate transform between the intrinsic frame of reference of the mouth and the intrinsic frame of reference of the nose. And it needs to send out a query saying, is there something out there that might be a nose and has this pose? But it's not the mouth's pose, it's the transform pose of the mouth in order to be a nose. So it needs to send out queries like that all over the place to look for noses. But of course, it might also look for an eye. And it needs to apply a different coordinate transform, one for the left eye and one for the right eye. And say, are there any things that might be a left eye out there that have this pose? That's quite heavy work for a transformer. What's more, if the nose gets this query from the mouth that's been suitably transformed to say, hey, I got a match. What it needs to tell the mouth, it needs to send back a value. And the value isn't the pose of the nose, it's the pose of the nose transformed by the inverse coordinate transform to get it back to the pose of the mouth. And that's the value it should contribute. So you've got these coordinate transforms ha having to happen. If you do parts interacting with each other and only supporting each other if they have the right geometric relationship. And that's how you do it with transformers. And we did indeed make something like that work with set transformers. We don't actually know how it worked, but that's the only way I can see that set transformers could actually get it to work. So I assume it's doing that. Um, but now let me explain a different way of doing it. So, so by the way, just to interject one second. So I, I, I guess you would agree with this, but just for clarifying and maybe those who know transformers quite well in the audience, I suppose the the fact transformers come with multiple heads could help because these heads. Oh yes, they'd have to. They'd have to come with multiple heads. You'd have to have one head for no for mouths asking about noses and another head for mouths asking about eyes. Yeah. Right, but that doesn't scale. That doesn't scale very much. So not okay, so, so not so good. So please so, tell us. Yeah, what's the solution? 
So here's an alternative. What the mouth does is it takes its pose and it transforms it by the coordinate transform between a mouth and a face. And it says, at the next level up, I'm going to have levels of embedding corresponding to the different levels of the part whole hierarchy. So I'm a major part. I'm at that level. At the level of the object itself, I can make a prediction about the identity. It should be a face. I mean, I, I can make a prediction about the pose. It should have the pose of a face that would contain a mouth like me. Now, the nose can do the same thing. The nose takes um, the coordinate transferring to the nose and the face and predicts the face and its pose. And notice, if the mouth and the nose are correctly related geometrically, they will predict the same pose for the face. That's called a Huff transform. Um, and so now you've got a much simpler operation. All you have to do is see if the predictions coming from below agree. So that, and what's more, when things are interacting, when the mouth and nose are interacting, they're not going to interact directly. They're going to interact by these potential faces interacting. The face predicted from one location should be the same as the face predicted from another location. So you've got these interactions between possible faces, that they should be the same, but there's no coordinate transforms going on there. The coordinate transforms have been done already. So that's much simpler, but it has a horrible piece of baggage that comes with it. And the horrible piece of baggage that comes with it is that, well, you weren't sure it was a mouth. So let me forget about mouth. Suppose it was an eye. We think we found an eye. Well, it could be a left eye. It could be a right eye. Or it could be a front wheel of a car. It could be the back wheel of a car. And we don't know which it is until we disambiguate it using context, because actually it's just a circle. So now, what we're proposing Thing is that without knowing what it is, you make multiple predictions of the next level up. So the next level up, you have to predict, well, it might be a face with this pose because it's a left eye. It might be a face with that pose because it's a right eye. It might be a car with this pose because it's a front wheel and so on. So you have to make a multimodal prediction. And the question is, can you get neural nets to do that right? And can you get neural nets to resolve them right, these predictions right? And what Laura showed is, yes, you can in a simple case. And so the idea is you have an embedding vector for this thing that's, say, a possible eye, or it's a circle, right? And it has an embedding vector. That embedding vector will get revised by top-down input later on as the net settles down, so it'll get turned into an eye rather than just a circle. But to begin with, it's just a circle. And so it has to predict that it might be a face with this pose or a face with that pose or a car with this pose or a car with that pose. And somehow... The embedding at the next level up, the embedding at the object level, has to be able to represent all those alternatives. And what Laura showed is, yes, you can get that to work. And now what happens is neighboring embeddings at the object level come from neighboring locations in the image. When you average them together, you're representing these multimodal distributions across all these possible alternatives in the unnormalized log probability space. So think of them as like a landscape with bumps, where bumps are modes, but they're unnormalized log probs. If you now just add those together, that equi that's equivalent to multiplying the probability distributions together. And if there's a common mode to a whole bunch of different multimodal predictions, that common mode will stand out. And because it's log probability distributions, when that common mode stands out, it'll totally suppress all the other modes in the probability domain. It'll yeah, be that's... like... OK, and Laura made that work. So that's one thing we did. That was on very toy data, basically faces and sheep made of ellipses. Um, so you look at an ellipse and you don't know what it is. Um, it's the arrangement of ellipses that conveys all the information. So that's one direction. But she was using supervised learning to make that work. She was also using backpropagation through time to make it work. So what you would do is you'd put in some ellipses, and it would settle down. You'd leave out a few ellipses, and it will fill them in, just like Bert does. And now you backpropagate through time to make sure it fills things in right. And that's how you can train it. But that was never neurally plausible. So those 
simulation showed that yes, you can make multimodal predictions for the higher level embedding, and you can get interactions between neighboring embeddings to resolve those. But the question is, what the hell's the learning algorithm? And the whole point about Glomis is meant to be neurally plausible. So there's no point in having backprop. Um, and what I'm running downstairs is a neurally plausible learning algorithm that just learn the whole of Glom unsupervised. OK. OK, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking for the next paper then to see how yeah. it works. But, but yeah, it's fascinating. And, and obviously, for those who might not have um, heard or, or interacted with Jeff, it's amazing how clearly you explain it. O obviously, some knowledge about transformers and, um, and neural nets, of course, is required. But you know, just watch the recording. And, and this is a great way to learn um, what this is what Sarah, right, uh, that, that you were talking, Sarah's and, yeah. and others work. So and so of course, cool. yeah, and this this will this will obviously maybe you you might go ahead and learn about the paper from the paper and you might see that the paper complemented with Jeff's explanation makes more sense. But really, I think this you're an amazing instructor of of of, of like um, intuitive like how things might work and I really like that uh, that 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 bit and I I miss it a lot because of course we used to interact um, earlier when we were both in in the same office. One, so, thing I should, one thing I should add yeah. before we carry on is that the paper that uses lateral interactions between these ambiguous parts and set transformers is called Stack Capsule Autoencoders. And the first author of that is Adam Kosiorek, um, who, is, who was a student of UITs in Oxford and now um, has a Google group in either Berlin or Zurich. I always forget which. Great, yeah, yeah, like that's good, and I think people are posting. Actually, the I think he's a deep. I think it's a deep mind. Group. I think he's a deep mind. Yeah, he's yeah. a deep mind. Um, great, great. So yeah, people can post the papers. So let's maybe uh, use the last ten minutes um, for quite a change of gears. Um, you've obviously seen the field of machine learning evolve a lot, and maybe one question I have, uh, maybe more re on the recent past, is. You mentioned a few works, but in your opinion, maybe tell me what's the most impressive. Let's use two time time frames. Uh, they're fairly short, given given the field. So, what's the most impressive result that surprised you? Maybe the most, not impressive, but really a surprise in the last, let's say, five years and then ten years. Quick answer. Okay, um, I'm not sure if machine translation fits into the last five years, but it's about five years ago. So. It really surprised me that um, backprop, starting with random weights, could um, learn to do machine translation that was better than what the phrase-based translation people had put a lot of work into. Initially, it wasn't. Initially, it was kind of comparable with phrase-based translation, but with an, a tiny fraction of the amount of human labor involved. Um, and the fact that that worked, once you put attention in, um, was just amazing to me. That happened much sooner than I thought. And the reason it was amazing is because machine translation is a symbol string to symbol string problem. So if there's anything those symbolic AI people and those linguists ought to be able to do, it's symbol strings in and symbol strings out, because they think it's all symbol strings in between. Um, it turned out the first thing you do with a symbol string is you throw the symbols away and turn them into vectors. Um, and the last thing you do with all these vectors is turn them back into a symbol string. Symbol strings are only out there in the world um, or in the auditory input and output. Um, inside, it's all vectors. So it, um, what amazed me was that um, the deep learning approach would beat them on that problem, which was you couldn't think of a problem that was more ideal for the symbolic approach. Um, so once it had won on that, it, the game was over, I think. Um, Great, I like that. Yeah, I any, thought you would. Any, 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 yeah, anyone, any other answers maybe from different so time more, frame? You pick the time frame, it's fine. More recently, the protein folding, because that's been a well-known problem for a long time. Um, I think that's down to deep learning is very good, and there's a lot of good researchers at DeepMind, and Demis is an amazing... Um, organizer of major projects. Um, I always think of Dennis as the Oppenheimer of deep learning. Um, 
although he hasn't yet made killer robots. Um, I'll, I'll and, pass the message. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and that's an example of something where you needed a lot of data. Although, as you said to me recently, it turned out it wasn't that much data. There was a lot of bootstrapping on unlabeled data. Um, yeah, indeed, it's 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 surprising that a few like it's it's MNIST plus plus size, but it's not not even ImageNet. Um, and, and that, that problem, yeah, that problem is interesting because a lot it's all about pose estimation. So maybe there's even ways to improve it. Uh, we should talk offline maybe about that. And then there's things like GPT-3, the big language models done at Google and OpenAI and elsewhere. Yeah, that's that's been amazing. I agree. For me personally, um, just how the same idea scaled up more just creates such a different qualitative uh, yeah. samples. And, it's quite unbelievable. I agree. And that's the kind of thing you'd never discover working on MNIST. Yes, yes. Uh, so that's the downside. But you know, you have you have uh, obviously many good students around the world uh, exploring all different things, uh, which must feel quite quite good. So maybe the last topic uh, on that note, right? Um, so Kipu is a community uh, that that tries to instigate more AI research uh, in South America. And given that you've seen sort of AI be not only prime time but also be a bit neglected, I mean approaches and so on come come in and out of fashion but would what would what kind of advice um our audience again is major majorly from south america what kind of advice could you be at, at two levels one is an individual that's tuning in and and wants to make a career uh lives in south america maybe there's not so many uh, well-known uh, centers for research yet and maybe more interestingly so maybe you can start with that um what could you recommend uh, someone from a government, right? Because obviously CIFAR um, is, is, was very important and um, probably you, you had a, a few things to, to, to say back then, but if now knowing what you know, what would you recommend um, governments investing in um, just to for the AI community to flourish in places like South America where it's just starting to happen more and more? So I think there's one thing governments could do that would be a huge win for AI and for everything else, which is make people wear masks, particularly in Brazil. <laughs> so, okay, and I, I must say, I meant Latin America, of course, um, not South America. Um, right, but but they could do that in Mexico too. Yes. Um, so now I've got that on, out of my on head. AI on AI <laughs> on AI. <laughs> yes. Um, I, my advice to people, and I don't, I haven't really thought hard how this applies to people in Latin America and South America, um, is get yourself to a good place where you're going to be surrounded by graduate students who are intelligent and thoughtful and know what they're doing, and will tell you when you're working on something that's already been done, and will tell you when you're working on something that's actually interesting. Um, and get yourself an advisor who's competent, but not necessarily famous. I think you get the most out of an advisor who um, has there's some evidence that they're good, but they still have plenty of time for you because they're not really well known yet. Um, those are the advisors who are probably the very best advisors. When I think back to when I was the best advisor for people, it was, it was when I was like that. Um, when I'd done some good stuff, but um, before it was really fashionable. Um, so, but I, I haven't really thought through how that applies to Latin America. The other, the other advice is um, trust your own intuitions. Now, intuitions come from a lot of experience. You shouldn't trust intuitions based on no experience, but get yourself a lot of experience. And the experience you get is from tinkering around with things. For me, tinkering around with different ways of learning MNIST is most of my life's experience. Um, I actually had a funny story from a student of mine called Roland Mimisevich. Um, and he's, he explained, I spent too much time on MNIST and um, I agreed I did spend quite a lot of time on MNIST and I could actually prove it because if you told me a particular pixel was on in one of the test images, namely pixel 28 across and 13 up, 
I think that's the one. If that pixel's on, I can draw the rest of the image. <laughs> and I thought Roland would be very impressed by the fact that I knew this fact. And Roland said, get a life. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So you, you literally overfitted to Amnist yourself. It's, but I do have a piece of advice which probably isn't welcome. Um, I believe people can do, people can be really successful at anything they choose, but just one thing. And that's the problem. I think you, to be a really good researcher, you have to be totally obsessive. Um, to be a really good human being, um, you need other qualities. And I don't think there's much point being a researcher unless you're going to be really good. It's like, I mean, maybe you enjoy it and you want to do it as a sort of hobby. That's fine. But it's like being a, a musician. A really good musician is worth thousands of not very good musicians just because the music's disseminated. And it's the same with research. So if you're going to be a researcher and you want to be a good researcher, you have to be really, really dedicated. You have to think about research most of the time. And it's just unfortunate, but that's the way it is. It could be worse. In the Middle Ages, if you want to be a researcher, you had to be a monk. Great. So I think that's, that's I, I might distill, um, no pun intended, <laughs> since we both work in distillation. But I think um, obviously being extremely passionate um, and I, I like the kind of linking researcher with musician and the amount of dedication that, of course, uh, Jeffrey has had his own life. Um, that's very good advice to pass on. And maybe the other bit of advice that I really like um, and distilling that again is that um, tinker with models, right? Like Jeffrey can yes, do it, tinker. does it all the time, even today. So um, if imitation learning is is to be to be pursued, I would say never stop doing that. That's that's great advice. And even at the personal level, sometimes one forgets that um, the research is down there with the gradients and the activations and the histograms and look at all these things all the time. Um, this was great, uh, Jeffrey. Obviously, that's sadly we we only have time for this. So thanks a lot for for your time, your passion, your your backstories, your explanations from the new and the old algorithms. I've had a great time. Um, hopefully folks in the chat also had a, a lot a lot of interesting um, discoveries from this chat. And of course, as Mayday said, we will move to the social gathering um, where we might just hang out and, and keep discussions uh, open. But thanks a lot, uh, Jeffrey, for your insights. Um, it's unbelievable. It's been a while since I, I talked to you and it feels like um, regrets of not trying to reach out more often. Uh, but yeah, this has been also great for me personally. So thanks a lot for your time, Jeff, again. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. And maybe in a year's time, we should do it again. Yes, yeah, maybe in person if people wear masks. Okay. Great. Bye for now. Thanks. Mayra, you're you're muted, I think. Uh, still muted, Miss Fortunato. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's working now. Okay, <laughs> so, okay, let's get to, to Gather Town. So you can join through this link. Uh, so kipu.ai slash gather. Remember like some of our sponsors, we have booths there. And I'm excited to also announce the next event of Kipu. It's going to be 
um, on Monday, the 30th of August at 5 p.m. And the topic is going to be very related to the pandemic. So it's going to be on AI and biomedicine, lessons learned from the pandemic and, future, and the future perspectives. So we're going to have these very prominent speakers, Gonzalo Moratorio from uh, Uruguay and Pablo Avelas from Colombia, Universidad of Lausanne. Sorry, I, I lost my notes about uh, the speaker's bio, but Gonzalo has been recognized for his work uh, by The Nature magazine, by uh, doing very impressive work on how to fight the pandemics in Uruguay. And Pablo Avelas has also a lot of interesting work in biomedicine and its applications. We also have more speakers to be announced. So thank you all for participating. You can follow and know more about our events through our Twitter account or our web page. We, you're also welcome to join our Slack through the kipu.ai.slack. And also we're going to share a link to a feedback form. So we are always looking for ways to improve. So if you can take the time and please provide us feedback about our social and also just chat today with Oreo and Jeff. And I'll see you in the social. So the link is on the chat and see you there briefly. Bye-bye.